Uh, thanks for stopping by. Feel free to ask any questions as we're going along. Just raise your hands if you're sitting on the sides. Maybe do Kermit arms so I can see you. Happy to take them. I'll put the slides up on SlideShare when we're done, so you're welcome to take furious notes or just look up them up after. Um, if you notice, there'll be little gray links at the bottom of the slides. If I ever say, here's a number or here's a thing that I'm pretty sure is true, there'll be a link to source material there so you can go check what I think to be true. So a little bit about why I'm standing here. Um, I used to run the database at uh, RIPE over here. It's called Aaron. So if you ever got an IP address, did anybody here ever got an IP address? No. Like seven of you got an IP address. That's awesome. Uh, so that's where we store the authoritative um, information for it. And then after that, I ran the uh, engineering team for Ubuntu Server. So I did 10.04 and 10.10, which was the first LTS, which is 10.04 on EC2, which is pretty cool. And I would argue it's still the best operating system for EC2, at least the most popular one. So if you believe the masses are right, it's the right way to go. Anybody here run Java on Ubuntu? I'm so, I'm so sorry for, we, we could have done way better. So sorry about that. Um, anyway, about four years ago, I joined a company called Crux. And the way I talk about it, it's kind of like Google Analytics for audience rather than traffic, or that thing that Netflix does to figure out what you want to watch, and that thing that Amazon does to figure out what you want to buy. We do, do that for everybody else. And so it's uh, content recommendation and content customization. And we do that with a very strong focus on data privacy. Like Our customers are people that have website properties like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and so on, that want to customize their content for their viewers. So they can drive engagement, better ads, better content. Uh, data privacy is specifically a big deal in Europe, so you see a bunch of European brands there because the laws are just much more stringent, so they need a solution that makes sure that the data that you give to them is held secure. So that's where we come in. Now, as a result, for every page view that they get, we get at least one or more requests as well. And that's from all over the world. And because we do a bunch of the content recommendation, we're on the critical path for delivery for all of those websites. And so we really don't want to cause any outages. Uh, so I always like to put numbers in perspective because hand-waving big numbers is just kind of silly. It is a bit of an apples and oranges comparison. Um, but for example, Twitter does about 9,000 tweets per second. Their record was um, 34,000. Japanese New Year 2013 when everybody's tweeting Happy New Year to each other. And our daily trough is 36. So it's Twitter like this, it's like that. And we do an average of about 65,000 new data points every second. Now, compared to Facebook's messages, just messages, that's like 130,000, so still kind of out of whack. Uh, in total, we do about 120,000 external requests a second on things. So in terms of monthly unique users, however, because we serve a lot of the big web properties around the world, we see most of the Northern Hemisphere and a good chunk of APAC, uh, which boils down to about 2 billion unique users. And we continually process the analytics for these people, both in batch as well as in real time. And that's about a two and a half billion uh, key data store that we maintain with lots of impressions and lots of data coming in every day, every second. So when you process this much data, and for this many users and for this many clients, even a small decision has a really big impact. Right? So 10% of users that you might be inconveniencing is 200 million users. That would be not OK. And so when we have a subtle change in service performance, we'll want to know about it. And if we want to make a design decision to make something different or better, we'll want to use real data and not just a guess to make sure that we do the right thing. And the same thing goes for cost-benefit analysis, right? Like if you do that, you want to go really, really deep on every bit of the moving parts. And so to do that, we collect, on average, about one and a half million unique metrics every second from our production environment. And so that's a line of about nine months. So we roughly two, two and a half exited over the last nine months just in, in data collection. So I want to talk to you about how you build such a system and where the pitfalls are and, uh, and, and how you should scale it well. And for more importantly, how you can make those metrics actionable, because it's one thing to collect one and a half million metrics. It's a whole different one to actually make them usable, right? There'll be a bit about data visualization as well. Um, we found, though, that the most effective visualizations are often the ones that are specific to your domain. And so there's a bunch of tools here that come with it that will work pretty well for the generic case, but there's some specialized ones as well, so please go and explore. And the same is, is true for monitoring. Um, I bet most of you already have a monitoring solution in place. In fact, and, and raise a small hand because we're recording and you don't want that to be recorded, but who doesn't have a monitoring solution in place for the website they care about? 
I'm gonna look behind the pillar too. Good, smart, don't raise your hand. Um, but even if you didn't, uh, you probably have a bunch more constraints in place other than how many metrics per second can I put into my monitoring system. So again, I'll show a few, but explore. So why does visualization matter so much? Computers can do an awful lot for you, but the human brain is probably better at matching patterns and shapes than computers are nowadays. So just looking at data points when something is wrong is usually not enough. A good visualization will help you with things like, does it always behave like that? What does normal look like and how does now look different? Uh, what changed recently versus some time ago? Was there a code deploy, machine failures? And what correlates strongly? Is disk I.O. the symptom or the cause of a problem? And what are leading indicators? Like disk I.O. rising might tell you that you'll have a problem 10 minutes down the road. And like I said, sometimes the shape is just as important as the data itself. So one of the things that we learned, uh, we have daily stand up next to our displays. And one morning, a few years ago, we see our usual traffic pattern and then it spikes up by 30% like this, very sharp. And it tapers off roughly like this over a span of 30 minutes. So our first inclination is, somebody just put a very large website live and didn't tell us. So it's sales' fault, right, clearly not ours. Ultimately, one of our clients misconfigured something and sending us more traffic than they should, somebody else's fault. Turns out, that's a news event. That was actually Kate giving birth to the royal baby. That's how quickly it goes. The birth is out, the announcement's out, everybody goes to their news site, watches it, tapers off. So now, just seeing that shape, tells me exactly what is, what is happening and means I probably should go read the news. So I'm telling this story to a friend of mine who works at Google. He's like, oh, we've got one of those shapes too. We have one where our QPS goes up dramatically. And of course, he works for Google, so he didn't give me exact numbers, but you know, significantly. But the cache hit rate stays the same. And over time, it's changed. It used to be like 15 to 20 minutes where this would happen. And it would go down now to maybe like one or two minutes. And that means that Everybody's searching for the exact same thing at the exact same time, hence the cache hit ratio. The query is Facebook down. <laughs> so point is, they now see this disparity and go, Facebook's down. Shapes matter. Most of us, if we're operators, probably use these metrics to just diagnose outages or troubleshoot our systems. And it's definitely valuable for that, but it's also really valuable for things like understanding trends over time or capacity planning performance tuning, A-B tests, or in our case, we do a lot of cost predictions and optimizations there. Learning the new normal of your application stack. You do a deploy, you change things, how does it look now? Um, design decisions, and not in the least, the KPIs for your business, they should be in there somewhere too. So we, we believe that metrics aren't just for operators. They're for everyone, and you should make them accessible to everyone and everywhere in your business. They'll help your developers write better code, uh, your team make better purchasing decisions, product decisions. Salespeople can actually prove your tech works. The amount of times that I've taken a graph from our live systems and go, yeah, it's fine, here you go, because I can show you the metrics correlated to your specific problem. And our support teams use them to quantify the problems. If somebody comes in and says, hey, your code is behaving weird and it's slow, we have a graph that tells us how weird and how slow and where. And often it's not us but them, or the internet in between, but still, you have a graph to prove your point. If you do it really well, it'll even help you with investments. This is our cost versus revenue graph. I had to take the numbers off because of you know, board stuff. But by making smart use of the data that we had, we were able to grow 10x while keeping roughly the same cost profile. We figured out where to optimize, where the waste was, and where we were not getting the bang for our buck. And these are costs across the board, right? That's hosting, storage, processing, CDN, DNS, all of it. Our revenue tracks our request per second and our UUs. We charge our client by the amount of people they see and the amount of page views they do. So if our revenue goes up 10x, our infrastructure is doing 10 times as much work. So using the data we had available, we made decisions that cut our cost down like this and we avoided at least one round of funding. And if you work for a venture-backed company, you know how much money that is in your pocket right there. So what do we do? What, what do we do to do that? And in the end, there was only one key feature that made the difference for everyone. We made it really easy to use. That's it. Just make it as easy as possible. You can't look at metrics that you don't have, and if adding metrics is hard, it won't get done. Now, there's probably some other characteristics that you would like, especially if you want to go from a couple hundred metrics a second to a million metrics a second. So highly scalable, highly cost-effective, obviously. 
something that's easy to operate. You don't want to hire a full-time operator or DBA to deal with your metric system. Um, something that's really easy to integrate with because you're going to have dozens of systems, not just one or two. Something that's easy to interrogate because even if you put in that many metrics, if you can't get them out in a meaningful way, they're not useful. And something that would be very configurable and very flexible on its inputs. And so I'm going to try to cover all those points as we go through, through the talk. But let's start with what you would want to see, what you would want to get out. So from all the metrics you're going to be collecting, most of them you'll probably only need in a very specific decision moment or when you're trying to answer a very specific question. So what should you be putting on a dashboard to, uh, to oversee the larger picture? In our case, it's the KPIs. And if you have your KPIs down, you can probably drill down further. What those are is probably different from company to company. But if you're a web-based company like ours, I would venture that even if you collect a million metrics every second, there's only two you really care about, latency and error rates. So in the end, all that we care about is, is that our customers have a good experience, and they don't have to wait very long to get that experience. So let me show you a dashboard that we build for every service that we have. Um, so we run a bunch of them, and I just picked one at random, because they all have the same characteristics. They serve some sort of request and some sort of amount of time. So this is the aggregated QPS across all of them. And this is a two-day window, so you get that usual wavy pattern. And the green one is the amount of request, and the red one, luckily flat at the bottom at zero, is the errors per second. You don't want any errors. The next thing we put on there is the response time of the cluster. Now, because there's many machines in there, you should always track the worst response time. Let's say you have 100 machines in a cluster, 10 of them are misbehaving or really slow. If the other 90 are within uh, tolerance, they're going to drag the average down, and you think everything's fine, even though 10% of your users are having a terrible experience. So graph the worst 95th and the worst 99th. We grab the 95th and 99th because even the difference between those two tells a very compelling story. If the 95th is very even and the 99th spikes up, you probably have an edge case somewhere. But if both the 95th and the 99th are going up, you probably have a systemic problem somewhere. And so why the 95th and 99th, and why not the average? It's because I care about the other half of my customers as well, and so should you. So as you see, every now and then, our 99th percentile does shoot up. At least now we know, even if we don't know why yet. It gives us something to go and look at. One of the main reasons your latency or error rate probably goes up is because something changed. One of those things is maybe a deployment of code, or perhaps your MapReduce job is writing to the database, and so you're flushing a lot of caches which might increase latency. Those are two things for us that might change our latency profile. So we add these events to all of our graphs as a vertical line. So we can immediately correlate a change in either request per second or latency rate to an event that we know that is likely to cause that. And so that's what those two lines are for. We use the brown one for deployments, and it's brown on every graph, so you never have to guess. You see a brown vertical line, that means deployment. And the pink one for MapReduce, which I'm hoping looks somewhat distinguishable on that screen. It's not a retina screen over there, so if you can look here, it looks much prettier. When you're developing your service, you probably spend a lot of time benchmarking it as well. Um, and so you have some sort of ideal capacity that you can put through a single node or a single instance or a single cluster or, or whatever it is. In our case, we set the safe capacity about two thirds of the max of the throughput. So that gives us the flexibility that when a code deploy happens and it's less efficient, we have some buffer. And if there are nodes in this cluster that start failing, we have some time to respond. To visualize that, we draw a horizontal line in the graph at two-thirds of the capacity of that service multiplied by the amount of nodes. And in the end, it looks like this. This is what all the components look like put together. And we have one of these graphs for every service that we run. This is the health dashboard that in one glance can tell you if everything is running as expected or trending in the wrong direction. In my opinion, if you have to go, through, go spelunking through the logs to figure out what's wrong or if something is wrong, you've already lost. So we have more granular dashboards for every service to, to dig deeper, and so you can troubleshoot common issues and so on. But a single overview like this is a great place to start. So why bother collecting all these metrics beyond the subset that you need for the dashboards? In my opinion, it's because metrics help you make good decisions. You can diagnose issues and correlate events. So any system you should develop should encourage the collection of metrics and make it really easy to do so. For example, when you see your app response time spike, that could be a slow disk, saturated network, swapping, CPU contention, any number of factors. But unless you're already capturing those metrics, you won't know. If you need to instrument your service when you see the problem, you have a handful of problems. One, 
you're losing time now instrumenting your service that you should have spent fixing the service. You might be introducing new bugs or slowness while you're instrumenting the service, so now it's apples to oranges, and you don't have any data from before the problem, so now the number 42 comes back and you don't know if that's good or bad or different. So, given that we want to collect as much information as possible, how do you do that in an easy, low cost and scalable way? Glad you asked. So we like the combination of StatsD, CollectD, and Graphite, and here's how we do it. On every node, we run an instance of StatsD and an instance of CollectD. CollectD gather system data, they come with built-in monitoring plugins for like disk, CPU, network, and so on, pass it to StatsD, StatsD to Graphite. Our applications use the same StatsD and send stats as they're doing their work off to Graphite. StatsD gets those basic stats, does some basic math on it, you know, uh, upper, lower bounds, upper 95th, upper 99th, and so on, and sends them to Graphite. Graphite stores the data and is our UI for interacting with it. We'll go through every component here individually and how to set them up efficiently. Given that this is probably one of the most heavy operator groups ever, who hasn't heard of Collecti before? One, two, three, not too many, awesome. So for the viewers at home, um, Collecti is an open source monitoring tool. It comes with a bunch of built-in plugins as well as the option to run your own. So as I mentioned, um, it has things for disk, CPU, monitoring, so, uh, some metrics, and so on. Um, and you can add extra plugins for things that maybe have an admin or stats interface, but does not produce the metrics that you want in a way that you want them. We do that for Redis and Cassandra, for example. So you can connect to the Cassandra JMX port or to the Redis info, get those uh, stats, put them into Collecti. And so we use Collecti as sort of a, an agent, a runner, to make sure we capture those statistics periodically because Redis doesn't proactively send those metrics, and even if it did, it wouldn't send them in StatsD format. So, on to StatsD. I'm assuming that's pretty much a known tool here. StatsD, yes, no, anyone? Awesome, yeah. So, about two or three years ago, when StatsD became more popular, a lot of hands would go up, StatsD, what's that, tell us more. And it's really cool to see that over the last couple of years, it's basically become a staple in most interfaces. So, because it's such a lightweight little daemon, um, and that can listen on UDP, it's really, really easy to run it on localhost and send metrics to it. So it just sits there, simple UDP packet with a very simple format to collect that metric. It'll send it on to Graphite after a bit of math, but you could send it to other places like Circonix or Zabbix if that's what you happen to have in your system. Um, you can send counters, gauges, timers, and sets. That's the native types there. The reason we run it on localhost everywhere is twofold. One, localhost UDP is guaranteed delivery. That's a fantastic thing if you don't want to deal with TCP retransmits and so on. Um, but you still have the benefit of UDP, which is fire and forget. The side note is, and we noticed that recently when we hit the 1.2, 1.3 million metrics per second mark, if your boxes get really, really busy, you might want to increase your uh, UDP window in the kernel. Because if you don't get, say, half a second or a second worth of CPU time, you fill up. So mostly guaranteed delivery if you set your kernel parameters right on busy boxes. But another benefit, and this is probably even more important, is that stats collection is now horizontally scalable. It's part of my node. I get 10 more nodes, I can collect 10 times as many stats. I just have to worry that stats, uh, stats you can send them to a graphite that keeps up. Few things to know about StatsD. Number one, pick a naming scheme and stick to it. It makes exploring in graphite much easier, and we'll get to that in a bit. It also makes creating graphs a lot easier. You can write loops because your naming scheme is very, very predictable. It also makes automated rollups much easier. Again, I'll cover that in a moment. And this is what we picked. So copy it if you want to, invent your own. It really doesn't matter, but pick one and stick to it. That is the best bit of advice I can give you. Uh, we separate our stats by environment, so like prod, staging, dev, and so on. Um, and then cluster name, so it's easy to drill down uh, how certain uh, cluster is behaving compared to anything else. We also suffix every stat with the host name it came from. And because it comes from localhost, we always know what that host name is. And this avoids duplicate stats, right? If I just send foo from three locations, and one time the foo value is 10 times as high as I expect, without that suffix of host name, I wouldn't know who sent it. Um, we set the prefix and the suffix for stats D in the configuration, and that way the clients don't have to think about it. And that means it's also always going to be consistent. So here's that, what that StatsD configuration looks like. We put the prefix 
in the config. That way it's always guaranteed to be stable. It comes from our configuration management system, which is Puppet, it just puts it in there. And the second line for global suffix is just a little bit of JavaScript that finds out what the short host name is. It's like hostname s except you can't do that in JavaScript, and this is how you do it instead. Uh, the legacy namespace, it's oddly enough, stetsy has been around for a little while. It used to have a crappy namespace, now it has an awesome namespace, but the crappy namespace is still the default, so make sure to turn that off. And then pick the percent thresholds you want the rollups for. We pick 95 and 99th. Uh, pick whatever works for you, but uh, make it explicit. Make sure to set delete idle stats to true, because statsd has an arguable feature that if you ever send a stat ever, it will keep sending zeros for the rest of its lifetime. And that way, you would just get a graph that you keep filling, and you have to keep uh, filling in on the graphite side full of zeros that were never sent. So we just tell it, if you haven't seen the stat, don't send it. All right, on to graphite. Who's new to graphite? Who's never seen or used graphite before? Okay, handful of folks, awesome. So we use it for our backend metrics store, and all the graphs you've seen so far just came directly from our graphite. It uses a, a system called WhisperDB to store its metrics, which is very similar to RRD, if you're familiar. Um, it comes with a built-in query composer and a graph creator, so it's a whole tool set in one. It can also return the data as JSON, which means that you can do your own analytics on it, your own dashboard, or use a third-party one, and do alerting on top of it as well, which is how we implement some of our alerts. And the nice part is that it's open source and free, as in beer. So one major constraint to be aware of is that beyond very powerful wildcards, there's no real search mechanism in Graphite. So when I was harping on about pick a naming scheme, stick to it, that is why. It's very hard to find stats if you don't know where to look. It would be awesome if the Elasticsearch guys and the Graphite guys became super buddy-buddy and would fix this all for us. If you guys are watching, if you guys could become buddy-buddy and fix it all for us, it'd be awesome. But until then, um, Stat naming scheme is really the way to go. So how do you set up a graphite that can actually take this amount of traffic? We currently run one graphite instance per data center, uh, and that is to minimize the risk of network failure between a local host statsd and graphite. Like if you have to send those TCP connections uh, transatlantic, the odds of something going wrong are way higher. You could run a cluster of two or more if you wanted data, data duplication on live systems. We aggressively back up instead, and we accept the fact that in a worst case scenario, we're gonna lose about 10 to 15 minutes worth of graphs. Graphs are not on our, our critical path, and if our graphs fail, we probably have bigger problems than our graphs failing. So we're okay with that, but you might not be. Um, every Graphite cluster has its own MySQL and Memcache. MySQL is for like, steward queries, for dashboards, for user accounts, and so on, and Memcache is for caching metrics. Um, the default configuration for Memcache that it comes with is not specifically tuned, so keep an eye on that, and once you start using it a little bit and you notice your graph's getting a little sluggish, you might want to tune the memcache parameters to cache them things longer and more aggressively. You should pick one of the graphites that you have as your web UI, uh, and that should be the instance that has the most data on it. So contrary to what we usually think, is like pick the one closest to you for latency purposes, it's actually pick the one with the most data on it because the other nodes have to stream data to it, which it will then aggregate and build the UI or JSON blob for you. So the less data it has to stream, the faster it'll respond. So in our case, we're based in San Francisco, but our busiest or most full graphite is in Ashburn, so that's our UI node. Um, there are a few key things you'll want to configure for your graphite setup, and I'll get into those next. After I have a sip of water. You can define your own data retention periods, uh, and that's how long you want to keep the data, because it's WhisperDB, which is like RD, which is a round robin database. It means that your database is a fixed size. The second you decide to store a metric, it's going to use a certain amount of data on disk. It will never change, even if it's full of zeros. So the amount of data retention you have and the amount of granularity you have determines that size. So pick something between granularity and size that works for you. And here's what we picked. You can be incredibly specific. You could roll up certain metrics with different granularity and so on, which is what the pattern is for. Um, but we actually just have one pattern for everything that says, keep data at a 10 second granularity for six hours, which is the same as the stats D flush interval. So your lowest granularity for graphite should be identical to the stats D flush interval, which in our case is both 10 seconds. If you move stats D to one second, move graphite to one second. You move them to 60 seconds, move both to 60 seconds. Um, then we do a 60 second granularity for 15 days 15, not 14, because if you do a moving two-week window of an hour ago or so, you go exactly over the cutoff date, and the granularity end is going to be slightly different than at the beginning. So 15 days. And then a 600-second granularity for five years. 
Now, our company is four and a half years old, so I don't really ha know what happens when five years are up and I lose data, but um, I haven't had to go back four and a half years yet, so I'm pretty sure five years is fine. The X files factor equals zero here means there isn't a second copy of that metric. So if you wanted a second copy of that metric, set it to one, two, or three, or whatever your replication factor is, and make sure that you at least have that many nodes. As I said, we're okay with dropping that metric if it happens. If you use this pattern, it'll be about 3.3 megabytes per metric that you store. So it's a very simple multiplier. If you want to have 100,000 metrics on that box, it's 100,000 times 3.3 megabytes. That's the size of your disk. All right, I promised aggregations as well. Graphite can do metric aggregation for you at the server side. So when the metrics come in, it'll do a bunch of math, which generates another stat that it will update dynamically. So you could do a total over a certain thing. You pay for this upfront in CPU and IOPS. Obviously, you have to calculate more, and you have to store an additional uh, stat. But it's absolutely worth it if that is a type of stat that you generally query, which we do all the time. We don't often graph individual nodes. We usually do total QPS for the cluster, upper 95th, upper 99th. And we can drill down further if we need to. So the first two lines there are the running average and the, uh, and the running sum. The bold bits are the only bit that matters there. Uh, to avoid Sorry, to avoid doing too much compute work for the common graphs, because we need the average and the sum most of the time, we pre-compute them like this. Uh, we do the same thing for the max and the min, just to see where our bounds are. You should make sure to do similar things for gauges and counters when you do the roll-ups like this. Um, we tend to dive in per host only if there's something that we feel we need to dive deeper on. The aggregate stats usually tell us the story. So, that's why we do the aggregations up front. That's the good news. Let's hop into some bad news. The very first problem you'll undoubtedly run into with scaling graphite is you run out of IOPS on your disk. If anybody is still running with A time on their disk, turn it off now. Uh, but we're in a room full of operators, so clearly that, that was already happening. The second thing is use SSD machines. That eliminates your IOPS constraint the SSDs will be faster than the daemons that Graphite has can write. The second problem is that Graphite daemons are quite CPU hungry when they run at full throttle. Um, they're written in Python, in Tornado to be exact, so they're single threaded and they can block on slow readers and slow writers, and there's an IO loop overhead if you have too many connections. So you wanna run multiple of each daemon type and get as fast as the CPU as possible as you can. If you have a choice between running two daemons on a slower or four daemons on a faster CPU, you're actually better off with four daemons on a faster CPU. We run this inside of AWS, and there we use a high one 4X large, which is their big boy box with about 60 gigs of RAM, uh, RAM in it, lots of fast CPUs and two terabytes of SSDs to run our configurations. We run five relays, six aggregators, and six caches on every node, and that works out pretty nicely. That will get you to about one, 1 1.2 million metrics a second per node. At that point, you get into CPU contention, and you want to split out your relays and your aggregators to a different host to do all the CPU work and then leave the cache and the UI on the second node. That should get you to about three million a second. Um, if you go over that, send me an email because I'd love to know what you're gonna do next. I'm pretty sure I could use the advice. Um, a little side story there. When we went from that 1.2 million and over, um, we was like, okay, what do we do next? What is the next big thing you can do to make this faster? And so we Googled, it's like, how do you scale graphite? And I found three very helpful blog posts at the top of Google, uh, which were written by my company. So anyway, um, if you want to host your metrics and alerting, you have some alternatives as well. I would say Circona is, is probably the best in breed here. It has great visualization, custom graphs, heat maps, really cool math as well, and does alerts too. If you want to self-host, Zabbix is probably the leading uh, open source monitoring solution out there right now. Both have a StatsD output module that allow you to send the metrics just the way I did, but instead of to graphic, you send, Graphite, you send it to them. And they're linked from the bottom over there. The real challenge with the hosted solutions is to keep the price point reasonable. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. It's great to put the graphs in, or the data in, but you have to get the graphs out. So there are probably dozens of ways to get the graphs uh, to make dashboards out of Graphite. Graphite has a built-in composer that lets you create dashboards you can explore and so on. There's lots of third-party tools. Uh, we actually use Graphite.js, which is, again, linked from the bottom there. 
the important feature that that had for us is you can use variables and you can use loops. That's it. That's all we really wanted because all of our naming scheme is so consistent and all the services do the same. I just say for S in service, draw the graph, draw the graph, draw the graph, draw the graph. Um, all our developers, all our operators know basic JavaScript, so it's no new DSL, no new tool to learn, no new UI. It's just write some loops. And so it's one less thing that they need to learn how to use, which means it's one less bit of friction to get the dashboards up. We host all of our dashboards as flat HTML files in a GitHub repository, and then we push them to S3. Basically means they're available. Our graphite is password protected, so when you pull up that page, it asks you for a username and password, you punch it in, and the graphs show up. And we put them on TVs all over our office as well. So even when you just walk around the engineering area, you're being told what normal is for all the services all the time. Um, as I mentioned, there's tons of other front ends to Graphite as well. Um, there are links from the slide at the bottom. There's somebody who did an in-depth review of about 30 different uh, dashboards for Graphite, strongly opinionated and motivated. And the one that I've been hearing particularly good things about is Grafana. So if you want to start there, that's probably a good one. I get a thumbs up for Grafana. Awesome. Two, three. One person has given me two thumbs up. That is how awesome it is. Great. <laughs> Cheers. So yeah, Grafana for sure. Um, so we talked about cost. Why do all this stuff instead of going fully hosted? And I think the easiest way to illustrate that is by comparing a few solutions. Let's start with Amazon CloudWatch. We're in AWS. CloudWatch already provides all the metrics you could ever want. Why not just use that? Uh, number one is every CloudWatch metric is 50 cents per metric. So I'd be paying them 500 grand just to have my metrics in there. Or actually, at this point, 750 grand because I just multiplied by a million, but it's now a million and a half. They also do a one minute resolution and no composite graphs. My industry works in per second, so per minute doesn't really work out very well for me. Um, Circonus, which I would argue is the best in breed for this, is at 30 cents per metric list price for their bulk thing. I'm pretty sure that when you show up and say, can I send you a million metrics, they'll give you a better price than 30 cents, but it's still reasonable, right? Our graphite setup is under $2,000 a month for everything. And so for over a million metrics, that's less than a fifth of a penny per metric. It's pretty hard to compete against, right? Now, here's why it's so much cheaper. Um, Graphite does graphing, not alerting. Not every metric for us requires an alert, but hosted solutions either don't tend to or can't differentiate. They don't know what you're sending, how important that is to you. So they have to do all the work for all the metrics in case you want to use all the features. It makes them more expensive. But because Graphite exposes data as JSON, you can build your own alerting on top of it if you so, so chose, and we do that for some of the latency monitoring. Ultimately, you could forward the metrics you wanted to say Circonus and send the rest to Graphite. And so you do a little bit of routing and saying, this is something I care about, send it here, but don't send it there. Um, if you're gonna do that, at least send the user-facing metrics to Circonus and get the best of both worlds. Importantly for us, the reason we care about that fifth of a penny or less is it aligns incentives. As operators, we want our developers to produce as many metrics as possible. I'd rather err on too many metrics than too few. It increases our confidence, increases our velocity, and increases our visibility. But by charging a premium per metric, you have to ask yourself each and every time as a developer, as an operator, as a business person, is this metric really worth tracking? Am I wasting company money and resources by sending this stat, knowing that how expensive it is? And then you're very likely to say, you know what, it's not worth it, I won't track it. So, this is a big pitch about why you should just track everything and how you do it. I also promised you with minimal developer overhead. Adding stats to an application is extra work for devs. Don't underestimate it. You might not be able to motivate everybody to do it either. You might not have any ways to emit languages for, uh, stats for the languages that you're using. Maybe your integration isn't very good there. And you might have some legacy apps that nobody knows about anymore and they don't want to touch. But that still doesn't stop you from instrumenting the environment in which the code runs. So it wouldn't give you insight into what the app is actually doing that's causing the difference in behavior, but you can still track that there's a difference in behavior, and that itself is already really valuable. So I'd like to show you a few bits of the infrastructure that we instrumented that way, and the code that we open source to make that possible. So number one is Apache. We use Apache to serve all of our static content. And that includes all the beacons we do to capture analytics. The reason it's all static is if we write a dynamic service, and we did in the beginning, and it was pretty fast. It responded in about one to one and a half milliseconds per request. 
We do so many of them that even optimizing that made sense, and we made that an in Apache process which responds in 200 to 300 microseconds, which means that I need anywhere between a fifth and a tenth of my cluster size. The downside is I no longer have a dynamic service that can emit stats. So we wrote something to do it in Apache directly. And we called it modstatsd. It's on GitHub right there. So let me show you how that works. You enable the module as part of a location directive. That's the location you want to track. You turn it on, and you tell it what prefix it should use so it doesn't clash with other stats. There's a whole long list of documentation listed at the bottom there. It integrates well with like CMSs, Django's. If you, you can set a note that is a stats name instead of inferring it from the URL and all that stuff. Um, but then a curl to say slash API slash foo gets you the prefix stats, then, uh, sorry, the prefix Apache, then the stat API foo tells you it was a get, told you that the return code was 200, took 31 millisecond, sends it off. You can use that for static content. You can use that for dynamic content. It doesn't really matter. And there's tons of knobs to uh, configure it, like I just mentioned. Because it's implemented as an Apache module in C, the overhead is minimal. It's about 13 microseconds. And on the outlier side, it's 20 microseconds per call. We can afford that. I'm sure most people can. It's currently still serving about a couple of billion requests a day for us and also for a bunch of other companies we know we're using this. So feel free to use it. We use Varnish to front all of our dynamic content. So along with caching and fallback behavior, we can again instrument all of our dynamic services. So all those legacy apps we have that didn't have the stats integrated, they still all live behind Varnish. And even any app that you have now could use the same thing. You simply Varnish forward to legacy app, capture all the traffic in between. So for Varnish, we capture at the very, very least the backend service that was used the time it took to respond, and the response code, very analogous to what we do with modstatsd. That means that even if the service itself is poorly or not at all instrumented, we still pretty, get a pretty accurate view of the response profile. And in terms of extra overhead, we found that on a loaded system, instrumenting all of our traffic, it added less than half a percent of a single CPU core. So we thought that was a valuable trade-off, and it's less than a few microseconds of extra request time. Actually, the Varnish module is faster than the Apache module. Uh, and this, too, is currently serving billions of requests at Crux and other places. So how does it work? Unfortunately, configuration is a little bit more work because you have to get it from varnish variables to send it off. Uh, but this is the simplest configuration you can have. Um, there's a blog post at the right bottom link that tells you exactly what everything is and where to get it from and a little bit of VCL snippet you can include. Um, the timing information comes from vmod timers, which is another mod I wrote that just surfaces the timing information that goes into the varnish log as a variable to use in VCL. There's nothing special there, but you just have to hook into the C version of it. Um, the stat generation is analogous to modstatsd. It gives us the consistency, right? So a bunch of our stats are prefixed with Apache and then have a certain format. The other ones are varnish and a certain format, but it's, it's the same thing afterwards. So remember this simple graph that I told you earlier that all of our services have? This is all from mod, uh, sort of from uh, the varnish plugin. So the, this is nothing from the app itself. This is all directly from varnish. So even though that app is instrumented, even if it weren't, I can still get at least this few for every HTTP service that we have. All right. Probably one of the best things you can do to instrument your infrastructure is provide a base library that includes statistics, logging, and monitoring in a way that you as an operator like. We're a big Python and Java shop, and so we created uh, libraries for both of them. I want to quickly walk through the Python stuff. Um, it's on PyPy, so you're free to use it or use it as inspiration. It's, it's free and out there. We definitely support it. All of our stuff runs on it. The main design goal for us was to make it really easy for developers to do the right thing. Turns out, by making it easy to do the right thing, people do the right thing. Take away the friction. So if you inherit from the Crux application, you get all the tools and instrumentation you need to build a good CLI app, which build the same graphs as I just showed you there for Varnish. Um, if you inherit from the Crux Tornado class, you get the same thing for a dynamic service. The library does make some opinionated choices regarding how stats are being sent. We think it's a great pattern to follow, but feel free to change that. Again, the important part is, as I mentioned with the stats D configuration, pick a naming scheme, pick a scheme you like, just stick to it. Uh, we made it available on PyPy, and the full documentation is linked right there from the bottom. So if you have a completely empty app, it would look like this. It gives you an argument parser in there, so at least you get a help. And you get standard arguments for things like log level and for stats. So anybody who inherits from this application gets a help pre-generated. So we as an operators can go, your app, dash H, and know what it does. 
rather than unrecognized option, dash H, sec fault. Um, the log levels, which we always set to warning in production, and we set to either info or debug on staging environments. That's part of our configuration management system. It just knows what is my log level version. Uh, if I'm on staging, it's this. In production, it's that. And I know your app takes that argument because it's built on the standard library. And the same thing for stats. We have a dummy stats client for development if you're running on your own, uh, on your own system. But as soon as it hits any of our servers, we just do dash dash stats, and it starts using the actual stats interface and starts sending it off to the local stats team. Because of this standardization, it really integrates nicely with our configuration management system. And so anytime that we deploy an app, as operators, we know exactly how the stats works, we know exactly how the logging works, we know exactly how it predicts. It also makes packaging really, really easy because it's built on a library that we know how to package how requirements work and so on. And the nice thing is your devs already get a head start. They don't have to implement things like argument parsing, logging, stats, they don't have to reinvent the wheel, and they'll actually thank you for providing a base set that works out really, really nicely. And so how does it look? It's really basic standard inheritance. You make an app, you inherit from uh, the Crux CLI application. The only thing that you have to provide is the name for an app. We require the name because it differentiates you in, in the logs, that differentiates you in the stats. That's simply the prefix we use everywhere. So your app doesn't mix stats with that guy's app, and it's always in the same spot in the stats tree. And then you get a logger and a stats object, and you just send those off as you would normally. Almost all of our legacy apps and most of our new applications, actually all of our new applications, are now integrated with or built on top of this. And so as we build more and more on it, we also did some wrappers for Bodo, for Redis, and for AP Scheduler, which are linked from the bottom right, that wrap the same thing. So like Bodo retries, Redis retries, timeouts, hauling to query take, and all that stuff. Because we often find that that is where either errors happen or where um, interesting deviations in performance happen. So by just using Crux Redis or Crux Bodo, it'll tell you if, if it failed and had to retry. There'll be log lines for that. We'll capture that as stats so we can easily quickly correlate where in the call stack it is without relying on the developers to say that Redis call was slow. That's great. In the, in the worst case, though, where you can't write a nice base library for the particular code that you have, you can at least fall back to simple Unix utility. So we have a tiny little script that effectively does this as part of every Jenkins deploy. Because everything can send a simple UDP packet, right? So this line is at the bottom of our deploy system at Jenkins. So when the build succeeds and it's ready to deploy, it pushes it. It just does events.deploy.name of the app. And that's the vertical apps that you, uh, for vertical lines that you saw for the deploys. So I know that when Jenkins ran, a vertical line shows up. It's extremely easy, and you can probably wrap anything around that even your start, stop scripts, and so on. I say everything can be wrapped like that, except for JavaScript. Um, for that reason, we actually wrote a separate stats app, which for some reason we haven't open sourced yet, but it's pretty straightforward, so we just should, which takes all the stats that you want as part of query parameters, and then just pushes them through statsd. And that is how we get uh, real user monitoring for our clients, which is like all those properties I showed you earlier, in case anything goes wrong with any tag we try to load, if anything is slower than what we expect, we send these events off, and then we retract them per publisher. So we know exactly how our stuff is behaving on your, on your system. The nice thing is with something like this is you can make the call asynchronously. So you can do it after page load, asynchronously, user experience is never impacted, it's a simple pixel fire away, and then your stats get sent. Who here uses supervisor to manage their processes? Handful of you, awesome. Running under DJB tools. Exactly. So Supervisor is a process manager that is written in Python. We use it to run all of our homegrown stuff. It has a few nice interfaces, plus again, it's written in Python, which makes it easy for us to extend, because we're a Python shop. Um, we have it set up to deal with logging, restarts, process limits, and so on, which again gives us operators a very nice way to contain the environment that we give our devs to run in. We can set the amount of processes that we run, the amount of memory that it's supposed to use, where the logs go, how often they're rotated, how long they're kept, the user it runs under and so on. It makes it really easy for us. But keeping a track of events in supervisor is not a default supported thing. So to keep track of things like starts, stops, restarts, backoffs, crashes, and so on, I wrote a little thing called sulfite. See, it's supervisor plus graphite, sulf, yeah, sorry. Uh, and so it sends a stat to graphite every time a service changes from stop to started, start to back off, and so on because it failed. So that makes it very easy for us to keep track when that service was restarted for either a deploy or a crash or a manual change or whatnot. And so 
the basic configuration is install it from PyPy and then set it up as an event listener, point it at your Graphite server, and that's it. That's all you need to do. And then this is what uh, a graph would look like that comes out of Sulfite. This is a staging environment we had where we're trying to debug an out of memory issue. And so this was every time that the application unexpectedly exited and was being restarted. And as you can see, over time, we finally fixed the memory issue. And a little bit to the left, it was crashing a lot. And then we pushed a fix, pushed another fix, called it good. We get that on all of our graphs now. All right. You, it doesn't just have to be code that you wrote that you can instrument. It turns out a lot of other people's code is very well instrumentable as well. Um, Puppet, for those that you, people use Puppet here or Chef? Puppet, Puppets, Puppets. Sure, Chef can do the same thing. Um, it pr produces a report at the end of its run of what it did, how many things it changed, how long it took, and so on and so forth. It's captured in log files, but it's also captured as a JSON file. We take that with a little reporting plugin, again, linked from the bottom, and we send all those stats to Graphite too. So we can correlate the Puppet run, how long it took, if it changed anything as part of that service, and again, graph that. Amazon, um, we run all of our stuff in Amazon. Turns out if you're not careful and you let your developer spin up whatever you want, um, it could get really expensive really, really fast. So we track in real time the amount of many, money we're spending with Amazon to make sure that it tracks what we think it should. Uh, we pull the data out of CloudWash and push it into StatsD. And so we can correlate what a single service is using in resources and what it costs. And to just give you a simple idea of what that is, at the right bottom is the, the link to the tool, which is mongetstats. It's a thing released by Amazon. You pick the namespace, you can go by tags, you give it the start and end date, you get a value, you push it into StatsD, and now you can correlate pricing for your system together with what the system's doing. All right, I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A, so here we go. Any questions? The question is, do we have a hierarchy? Do we go from a smaller, sorry, from a larger to a smaller object? Yes, we do. So we start with a prefix for stats. And the reason is we have other things that emit stats other than just stats D. Um, Java has its thing called Yammer metrics. So we have a, a, a field for that as well. And Collecti has its own one too. So the prefix is stats. And we pick the environment very specifically because we have a dev and a prototype environment. And we don't want ever, even by accidental globbing, to have dev stats come into prod stats because they'll really skew things off, right? You get a small machine that crashes a lot versus a stable system. So we start with environment, then we go to cluster, indeed even more specific, and then we suffix with host name, and it's specifically the host name suffix, so we can roll up. We always know that the last little bit in the name is the host name, so we chop that off, and we replace that with the word underscore total, and we go up like that. In between that is just the name of the app, and then you can do whatever you want. We indeed do as much hierarchy as possible, particularly from most precise to least precise. So it might be something like app, the run, Redis, fetch error. It just gets the most granularity there. Um, the, the lineation is usually really, really good to do like error dot and then the name of the error. So you could graph error dot star as a sum series and just get all your errors. Because as a graph, you don't really care whether it's type error one or type error two. You just care that there's errors and you'll go look if you need to. So yes, from least specific to most specific suffix with the host name. Does that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Sir? Uh, so you have multiple uh, carbon relays and batches running for graphite nodes per data center. Correct. How do you distribute the uh, metrics that are coming to the relays? Is that So the question is, you have multiple relays, multiple aggregators. How do you distribute? The only reason that we run the relays is so we can do consistent hashing between the aggregators so the aggregators always get the same stat to aggregate on. Otherwise, you would have two stats and they would have to re-aggregate at the end. That is the only reason that we do it that way. Does that answer your question? I want to say no, given your face. Yeah, so his statement was like, carbon relay gets overloaded. It does the same for us, so we run five relays, and what we do is, uh, in configuration management, we split between those five ports. 
So we basically say it's uh, in Puppet it's called FQDN Rand, and as a large enough amount of machines, it's roughly one fifth each. But it doesn't have to be exact. But I go one fifth of you goes here, one fifth of you goes here, and that's consistent between runs. So that's how we split them up, and we could add relay number six, seven, eight, nine, ten if we needed to. But we find five relays to six aggregators to six caches is the perfect ratio for us. Basically, relay to aggregator is almost the same traffic, but they just have to round up a few new stats, and then aggregator to cache is exactly the same, because for every stat the aggregator emits, the cache has to store one. So hence, 566. Six, six. And it would also probably be like 788 eight, and 11, 12, 12, and so on. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Any other questions? Sir? Um, if you were going to put a, a screen processor somewhere in here to monitor it, mm -hmm. If you were to put a stream processor in here to do monitoring, how would that hook in? So hypothetically, I would have written a tool myself called PipeD, which I would have hypothetically open sourced, where I would hypothetically be sending all these stats, which would go to a hypothetical uh, Kafka stream listener, which I haven't yet open sourced, which would go into Kafka, and then we do storm process. Sorry, then we would hypothetically do storm processing at the end. Does that hypothetically answer your question? Uh, find me afterwards. I'm happy to point you at the code. Any other questions? I'll look over on that side for a moment. Sir. So on your uh, graphs, uh, you are showing a lot of stats. So is there a uh, way that I can look at the graph and I want to see at what happened at that data point? Is there like a backward uh, uh, I don't know, in, uh, connection between the actual data and the graphical data that I'm looking at? Or do you have to step down into the log or stats that you're so your question is, can I get the actual raw underlying stats for one given uh, data point or one given slice of time? Yes, you can. Uh, the data can be returned as JSON. The caveat here is that unlike some other systems, Circona's being at the top of that list, it, Graphite doesn't actually store the full set of timing, which is why you tell it, give me the 95th and the 99th. Um, it, has, it loses granularity over time. So you would get those rounded up numbers. So if you wanted to create a heat map from that, you can instruct statsd to do it, but it pre-computes the heat map for you for the stat that you care about. So once it's in graphite, it's somewhat too late. The numbers that you sent it have better be the right numbers, but you can send it more numbers. You can never go back to the original set that computed that number. So once you have the average, you don't have the numbers anymore that made the average. Does that answer your question? That's why we store uh, both the individual streams for all the hosts and the average. So at least I have the number for the individual host. But if 100 stats made up that average, unless I stored those explicitly or mentioned them as a heat map, I've lost those. Yes. 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 So as the gentleman pointed out for the viewers at home, you can choose to keep all of them, but that's a very, very large data set, and it consumes a lot of space. Any other questions? I'll stare over on that side again. Sir. Have you ever considered putting something on top of this like Riemann? Yes, we have. Uh, it was about a year and a half ago. We couldn't quite get Riemann to work, and it's been uh, a thorn in my side ever since. Uh, we should probably give it another try, but one of the things that would be our utopia is to send that live stream out and make the decisions on the fly, as in how much we care about this or not. We compensate a lot by math, and we compensate a lot by other trickery and some other ways to look at it, but it would be lovely to unify it. So back to why don't I care that 15 minutes of my metrics is gone is because we do that work somewhere else. But if I wouldn't have to do that work somewhere else, that would be great. I haven't figured out yet how to unify it and have both the scale and the resilience I'm looking for. If you have options and ideas, I'd love to hear them. Uh, you can, yeah, I'll Google afterwards and see if my name comes up again. Uh, we can brainstorm after, though. It is, it is definitely where we want to go. I thought I saw a hand over there somewhere. I did not. Looking back at the room, any other questions anywhere? Going once, twice. All right, thank you all for coming. I'll be right outside there if you have more questions.